inside this video right here, I'm gonna talk to you about sinus bradycardia and everything you need to know about treating sinus bradycardia out in the field. Let's talk about it. I want to help decrease failure rates for NREMT, for EMT school, for paramedic school. Watch these videos, watch this content, and believe me, you will start to understand EMS medicine. Anybody out there that wants to serve their community as an EMT or a paramedic should be able to do that. And I'm here as a paramedic coach to help you achieve that. Hey everyone, it's Paramedic Coach back here with another video. If you're newer, hit like and subscribe down below. Make sure to hit the notification bell to make sure you're part of the Paramedic Coach Army here. This is the number one place for weekly EMS videos for learning EMS medicine. And I wanna welcome you to the Paramedic Coach. What I'm gonna talk about today is the adult having sinus bradycardia and what to do based on your ACLS algorithms. So you know it for class, so you know it for NREMT. Again, when we get out in the field, that's our on the job uh, tips and tricks. This, is good. this video here is geared more towards passing your exams, but I wanna give you some pearls about sinus bradycardia first. Now, when we talk about sinus bradycardia, I want you to know one thing. Use your brain when you're out in the field. What I mean by that is, think about it. I'm a huge runner. My heart rate is usually somewhere in the 40s. Okay, I've been as low as you know, 40, 41, 42 as a heart rate. Now, is there anything wrong with me? No. I just, I've trained my heart to be at that level, okay? Doesn't mean 60 or 64 isn't good or bad, just means that I'm a conditioned athlete, that's what I'm doing, right? So first, you wanna ask your patient, hey, do you do any sports, are you an athlete? Is your heart rate normally this low, 40 or 50? Before you do anything, okay? Hey, just check it out. So if the patient has a slow heart rate, right, but they're not complaining of anything, you just monitor it, okay? So the first thing here is there's no symptoms, okay, no symptoms. You're just gonna monitor. Okay, okay, you got, hey, hey man, you got sinus bradycardia at a rate of 40? I'm just gonna watch out to you. How you feel? I feel good. Okay, great. I'm just gonna do, you called 911 for some reason, I happen to come across this issue. Okay, maybe the patient's not a runner, right? They're not an athlete, but their heart rate's sinus bradycardia at 40. They don't know why. Oh, what, what would I tell you to do? Well, I, I would tell you to do a 12 weight EKG and do routine ALS. Okay, now which MI has it normally has a low heart rate? Inferior wall MIs. What if he's having a, a silent or a sneaky inferior wall MI? Right? Do a 12 weight EKG. Now, what do we do if they are symptomatic? Well, now it comes for stable versus unstable. Okay? So the question becomes how do we determine stable? versus unstable on test day, but also out in the field. The king is blood pressure. Meaning, if the patient's blood pressure is below 90, what does that mean? That means they're unstable. If they're above 90, they're stable. Why is that? The reason for that is you need a systolic blood pressure of 90, a MAP of 60, a mean arterial pressure of at least 60 to perfuse your organs. So on a test question, they usually make it easy for you and it's easily a systolic of 90, okay? So that's king. Now there's two other things to consider. Mental status and their symptoms. But if the blood, what I mean by this is the blood pressure is under 90, the test is trying to tell you they're unstable, okay? Now, if the patient has symptoms and their blood pressure is normal, they're in stable land. If they don't have symptoms and they're awake, all right, and they have a good blood pressure, they go to monitor. So let's do it one more time. Look at BP mental symptoms. Okay. Patient has no symptoms, good blood pressure, good mental. They have no symptoms, they go here. Science bradycardia at 40. What do you do? No symptoms. Blood pressure is good, meditation good, monitor routine ALS. 
They call 911, think about it, with teen ALS, okay? Do a 12 weight. The big thing here is 12 weight, okay? Stable. Well, that means the BP's good, the mental's good, and they have symptoms though. So we're thinking, well, this could be a heart rate issue, okay? Unstable means BP is not good, and these are probably not good too. But it doesn't matter if the BP's off, if their MAP is below 60, doesn't really matter. They're unstable, okay? And remember on the test, it's gonna uh, test, it's gonna be this black and white. But out in the field, it's pretty darn similar to what I'm talking about here, okay? And we'll talk about this in other videos, but we're in the same sheet of music here. Now stable, what do we do? Atropine. Okay? So atropine's gonna be our first drug of choice for bradycardia, okay? Now there's gonna be other drugs down here we can try. Okay, I'm gonna talk about those in a second. Unstable is gonna be pacing the patient, okay? Transcutaneous pacing. So remembering first, how you're gonna pace the patient, you gotta place the pads in the patient. We first have to get electrical capture and then get mechanical capture, okay? So meaning, we have to see the, we have to see the patient working, essentially, on the EKG spikes and then we got to make sure the pulse matches that and then we're good they're being paced by the monitor their heart rate's so low they're being paced by the monitor now before we move on to the final two drugs i want to remind you about what atropine does and the easiest way to remember atropine here it is remember that atropine if you think about the vagus nerve right the vagus nerve is going to slow us down but think if your vagus nerve is being overly stimulated. Basically, if think about it, the vagus nerve, it's over, it's overused as a vagus nerve, right? Think of, that's the easy way to remember it. Atropine is say, hey, stop being used so much. Let's take, let's take our foot off the gas pedal with that vagus nerve, which is causing you to be so low, and let's release off a little bit. And if we release off the vagus nerve a little bit, we're gonna shoot forward. That's the way I think about and remember atropine, how it works. Remembering that your sympathetic and parasympathetic are always going against each other, okay? Now, our two friends, if atropine doesn't work, okay, you have dopamine and epinephrine. Both these drugs, obviously, are gonna act very similarly. They're gonna jack you up. These drugs are primarily used in hypotension, meaning, patient has a low blood pressure, they're used for their effects, increasing that blood pressure and heart rate. Well, they also increase heart rate, so they're on here too. So you have 220 mics per kilogram a minute, and you have two to 10 mics a minute. This is sinus bradycardia for your ACLS. This is sinus bradycardia for your exams. Remember, with an unstable patient, we first have to get electrical capture and then get mechanical. So think EKG and then get a pulse. Everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video on sinus bradycardia. Before you go, if you're one of these three people, click the link in the description down below. Now, I have a program, of course, that helps out people that are preparing for EMT advanced or medical school. People who are struggling to understand the why behind what they do in school or third, someone who's trying to pass their NREMT boards. My whole goal with the paramedic coach is to find you as early as I can in your EMS education so I can deliver my video vault to you to the description down below so you can start to understand these concepts cold and understand these concepts simply. So if you wanna learn more, click on the link down below. And everyone, I wanna thank you for the kind words, all the support, all the likes, all the subscribes, all that stuff. And I will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Cap oh, like everything that you were saying was just connecting all these, all these, you know, links inside my brain. And I, I just knew right then and there, um, I have to have this program. I have to have all the information that he's willing to give. I need all of it. I went through it. I, I spent the time and money in other areas. And I'm, I'm just gonna let you guys know that uh, this was everything I was searching for the whole time. The first couple of videos I watched, um, what I noticed, it just, I, I just immediately started connecting dots um, on some of these things I, I didn't have grasped. Went on there, then I continued reviewing, and I did it for about a month, and you know, it, it helped a lot. Like I said, even after school, and I took that test one time, and I passed it. Your particular 
program, you have your students engaging and you have your students discussing and you have your students actually using your products. And I'm seeing time and time again, um, students that are coming in and announcing their new certification with National Registry. Well, it's obviously passing the exam, doing it pretty quickly, 70 questions in about an hour. Um, well, you definitely are like how your videos are. Like I wasn't sure how it was going to be, but you are how you, your videos are. So that was awesome. So people who are getting ready for paramedic school, or if you're getting ready to go in the Navy as a corpsman or as an army medic, um, you want to prepare yourself. Evan, I know you've got a program that helps people prepare that way. So bottom line is guys, you don't ever want to hear something for the first time with a bunch of other students. So if you're in a competitive learning environment, you don't want to hear about AFib for the first time where everybody else, you want to have an understanding of it before you walk in the room. From 120 questions, passing two sections, um, near passing one, and then I think two below passing to seven questions passing completely. Seven thousand dollars for school plus everything else that you put into it all the time and all the time off work and family and everything. It's to see people fail and fail and fail and then just quit, which I know a couple of people who have. I tend to say, you know, it doesn't hurt to have somebody right there to talk to, you know, send a question. Anytime I get the chance, I'll, I'll gladly offer or advise them to sign up for you and your paramedic coach. It's, it's truly helpful and amazing at what you do. I want to help decrease failure rates for NREMT, for EMT school, for paramedic school. Watch these videos, watch this content, and believe me, you will start to understand EMS medicine. Anybody out there that wants to serve their community as an EMT or a paramedic should be able to do that. And I'm here as a paramedic coach to help you achieve that.